Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning, Father. My friends, I'm Father Frank Pavone, National Director of Priests for Life. Let me be the first one to welcome you to the 2015 Walk for Life. During the first hour before the rally on the main stage commences, we will have a gathering here with testimonies of those who have been impacted most directly by the devastation of abortion. Moms, dads, siblings, grandparents, former clinic workers. They will share testimony, one after another, to the fact that abortion is a lie. They will share testimony, one after the other, to how abortion destroys relationships, self-esteem, and in fact, every good that God intends to give us, abortion attacks and destroys. They will convey the truth of that, and then they will convey the even greater truth that there is mercy, that there is healing, that there is salvation in Jesus Christ, and that those who are locked in the silence and shame of abortion, those who are in dark corners, unable to even lift up their heads to the light of day because of shame for what they have done, do not need to stay there. They do not need to stay buried under the weight of despair because there is one who comes to them and says, get up. There is one who comes to them and says, rise up. You can rise above the power of abortion. You can be freed from the power of your sins. And of course, that is our Savior, the Lord Jesus, to whom each of these people who gives testimony today will bear witness. So I welcome you to this 2015 Walk for Life. I welcome you to this gathering of the Silent No More campaign and to this initiative called Healing the Shockwaves of Abortion. We need to continue to reveal to our nation and to the world what abortion does to the baby because too many of our fellow citizens still do not realize that is a baby, still do not realize that abortion is an act of violence that kills that baby. But then there are shock waves. Then there are reverberations of destruction that go proceed to the mother, to the father, to the grandparents, to the siblings, to the friends, to the abortionists. Even we who are pro-life advocates are wounded by each abortion that happens. And what do I mean? When we speak up, when we write, when we educate, when we preach, when we try to elect pro-life candidates, when we try to pass pro-life laws, when we sidewalk counsel, when we counsel in the, in the pregnancy centers, we're trying to save lives every day. And yet, so often, we fail. We try to intervene to save a life, and that baby gets killed anyway. Brothers and sisters, that impacts us. We, the pro-life advocates, are wounded by every abortion that occurs, and so we need to appropriately grieve those children ourselves. It's not just the mom and the dad that have to grieve their child. We need to grieve the children. We tried to save but lost. And that's part of this initiative as well, healing the shockwaves that impact us all. And the hope belongs to us all, too. We are people of life. We are people of hope. This evil will not have the last word in the human story and in the story of our lives and of our nation. Abortion will not have the last word. The last word, as testified to by this gathering here this morning and this walk for life today, the last word belongs to mercy and to life. So to that, let us give witness now, and I introduce Georgette Forney. You want me to pray? Okay. We'll pray, and then we will commence our testimonies. Let us pray. Father, you are the source of life, of hope, and of mercy. You are the living God, ever true, ever loving, ever present. 
You are with us today. You inspire us to be here, and you speak through us, Lord, humble, sinful instruments. Nevertheless, you accomplish your purposes by calling us, by raising us up, by putting your hope in our hearts and your words on our lips. You raise us up, and you use us as your instruments. So let that again happen today, that this walk, that this gathering, may first of all inspire us and then through us may awaken the conscience of this community and of this nation and may inspire hope in them. In the end, bring us all around your throne to say forever, worthy is the lamb that was slain, to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and praise, for he is the Lord of life and the Lord of mercy forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Father Frank. Greetings, everyone. My name is Deacon Georgette Forney, and I am with the Anglican Church in North America, and I am the president of Anglicans for Life and co-founder of the Silent No More Awareness Campaign. I am grateful that God has called me to this work and it is an honor to be here with this great group of courageous men and women who are going to share our stories with you. The key thing that I want you to hear in our stories, not only of our pain, but of the healing we have found, the forgiveness we have received from our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. We know we are forgiven. Every day we carry the regret but we are forgiven and we are grateful and we celebrate that and it is in that forgiveness that we speak boldly. We speak because we have broken the silence, the secret has been brought into the light and you know folks who are still in darkness, who are afraid to speak and we want to encourage you to find healing, receive forgiveness and then join us in being silent no more if you too share our experience. Healing programs can be found on the Silent No More website at abortionforgiveness.com, abortionforgiveness.org. All you have to do is put in your zip code, scroll down, and there's a list of resources that you can go and find healing, resource, uh, healing help as well. We want everyone to heal. And just as the impact, the, the, the epicenter of the abortion is our dead baby, the brokenhearted mother and father, when we heal, that healing can also reverberate, just like the pain of the, of the abortion reverberates out to touch not only ourselves, but our families, our parents, our siblings, the kids we go on to have. But when we heal, that healing goes out as well, and that's the hope we want everyone to take home with them. I am so honored to stand on this stage with the courageous men and women that are behind me. And as we started the Healing the Shockwaves initiative, this year we have invited those who have also been impacted by abortion to be silent no more with us. And to start this off, we are asking Monica and her daughter to come and share the reality of abortion, not only from the mother's perspective, but how it has then impacted her daughter. So, Monica. Thank you all. Thank you, Monica. Jordan, thank you for joining us today. When I take a look back at my life, I can see the rippling effects of my every action. Maybe some of you remember my story. I have carried my scarlet letter for all to see. I have shared with you my soul and my regret. I have shared with you the things that are permanently etched in my head. The oven mittens for stirrups. The poster on the ceiling as a focal point. The sound of the machine feeling alone in the decision, in the pain, and in the loss. The loss of life and the loss of my own soul. 
I have shared with you the darkness that took over and had almost conquered my life. My daughter Rebecca would have been 20, my son Esai would be 19, and my daughter Elizabeth would be 17 years old right now. My every action has caused a shockwave that has greatly impacted my family, living children, and friends. My daughter Alina and son Devin at 14 and 11, 11 years old respectively, have experienced the loss of siblings. They long for what could have been and wish I would have been strong enough to make the choice to choose life. My mother shared with me the greatest impact of abortion was dealing with the unsurmountable sorrow of losing her grandbabies. However, it was nothing to the destruction that her own daughter's life had took. My friend who went with me to the abortion clinic for my first abortion shared with me, we were so young. She said she didn't know what to think. She thought she was trying to be a good friend by helping me. But she sees now that it really affected my life. The trauma is overwhelming and can come and go when you least expect it. My family and friends and children have stood by me through the minefields of the abortion trauma. That's my light. My unfailing love and grace has poured out onto my life. I am thankful that I am not alone in the healing process. For me, God guides my path with each healing moment I embrace. God is my healer, my, my restorer. I pray that within this story, you find some peace and seek healing to help you begin in your healing journey. I will pray for all of us who have been affected by abortion. God bless you all. My daughter would like me to read hers. My name is Alina. I am 14 years old and I'm from Arizona. To start with my childhood, it was a good one. I grew up with both of my parents and my little brother. Although everything family-wise was good, it always felt like something was missing. Whether it was one of my siblings or two, it felt like someone else was meant to be there. The treatment from my mother was fairly harsh, but I thought it was just the push for success. I was around eight when my mother told me about her three abortions. The emotions that were running through me were sorrow and loss. If I remember correctly, it was both surprising and sad to find out I could have had three other siblings. Last June, I went to a retreat called Sibling Survivor Retreat, or Lumina. The retreat was a great experience. It brought closure to everything, basically. It can help others by helping, helping them talk about their feelings and bringing them closure to the unborn siblings. I want others to learn that abortion not only affects the mother and fathers, but it also affects the living children. We suffer from the loss of sibling, a loss period. It affects my mom because she regrets her abortion, and that affects me because the more I begin to think about it, and it sucks not having my other siblings. It's pain that I wouldn't wish upon anyone. I just hope this opens your eyes as to the ripple effect of abortion causes. Thank you for listening. Vicki? Hi, my name is Vicki, and I'm from Sheep Ranch, California. I had two abortions in the early 1970s. At that time, abortion was only legal in New York and California, and I lived in Massachusetts. It was a long time ago, but sometimes it seems like yesterday. Some things about them I will never forget. I was pregnant bo both times by the same man. He did not want to get married or have children. If my parents even found out that I was sexually active, let alone pregnant, they would die. These were enough reasons for me to choose abortion. My boyfriend went with me for the first one. The second one he did not know about. I remember the procedure itself and feeling very removed from my body when it was done. I remember nothing after the first one, but after the second one, I remember trying to console another woman who was crying after the procedure. I stayed at a hotel in New York City that night 
couldn't, I could not get warm. I called the front desk and I asked them to check, check the heater. There was nothing wrong with it. I was freezing, chills passing through my body like a knife. It was a sensation that was to return many times over the years. The next day on the bus going home, I felt a huge emptiness inside and I cried out to God to never let me do this ever again. I did get pregnant again by the same man. I kept wanting to put those babies back in my womb. This time I moved to California and my son was adopted here in San Francisco. For years I struggled to make something of my life. I married a man I met in a support group. We were both mourning the loss of a child, his by divorce, mine by adoption. I did not recognize my losses by abortion. I had another son and my stepson came to live with us. I was still not happy. I did not know what was wrong. I thought it was about the adoption. But a, an astute pregnancy center counselor told me it was probably more likely the abortions. I didn't want to go there. I worked and worked to be the perfect wife and mother and stepmother. I overachieved constantly at my work. I was still miserable and my children and my husband knew what people saw on the outside was not who I really was. I took the training to be a pregnancy center volunteer and was told that I would have to go through their post-abortion Bible study before I could counsel. I thank God that they made that rule, and I believe that they made it when they saw me coming. I was the first one who volunteered after they made that rule, and I thank God they made it. Finally, through this Bible study, I began to see how the abortions had affected me. I let my felt self feel the incredible grief I had for the babies who I had aborted. I saw how my relationships with my husband and with my children were marred because I could not let myself get close to them. I could only punish myself for what I had done. So my husband and my children that had nothing to do with the abortion were affected and were in pain because of my abortions. I began to heal. The truth that Jesus had paid the price for me with his blood became, began to be real to me. I did the study a second time a few years later and accepted his complete forgiveness and restoration. I knew then, as I do now, that my babies are with Jesus in heaven and I will see them there someday. And my mom is with them. And my mom is another person that was affected by my abortions. Eventually, I did share with my parents about my birth son and about my abortions. And when my mom was 94 years old and she was in a nursing home, she said to me that she had a dream and the two Irish ladies in the room next door to her in the nursing home were taking care of all the aborted babies. So I know it was still on her mind. We held hands and I said to her, Mom, you're going to be with them before me. Will you love them for me? And we cried together. I do not get that chilled sensation anymore, even standing up here in front of all these people. <laughs> even when I'm speaking of them, I thought for so long that I should never have been born, but now I know his purpose for me is to lead other women in healing Bible study. I have met and know so many women and men like myself who have struggled for years and did not know why. And that is the reason I will be silent no more. Good morning all. Thank you all for coming for this Walk for Life. My name is Bill Dunlap. And as you might see here with the lovely ladies behind me, I am the only man speaking today. And there's a reason for that, because in Ezekiel, it talks about what is the man, where is that man that will stand in the gap? And today I've been asked to do that, and I feel confident that I can share this with you today. Um, as a person who participated in an abortion, it is time for men to stand up and be part of that. The chemistry is very simple. 
It takes a man and a woman to make a child, to make a life. And we're 50%, if not more, of that equation. It's time for men to stand in that gap. In right. Thank you. In 1974 and 1980, with a single woman I was living with and with my first wife, I participated in two abortions. At the time, it was no big deal to me. It was like going to a dental appointment. Something had to be removed. My insensitivity to that procedure, that atrocity, has haunted me ever since. I now have grandchildren, four months old and 16 months old, and I look at those small babies and I think about the babies that are now in heaven that were not allowed to be born on this wonderful earth that God has given us. So I grieve that, but that unawareness became a life-changing event for me. As I move forward, I understood that I need to be part of the solution and not just the grieving participant of something that happened in the past. So I move forward in that. In my years going forward, I found a down part in my life. After those abortions, my first marriage ended in divorce. I got into excessive alcohol and an ungodly life. It led me to face surgery for the first time in my life. I was facing back surgery. I thought God was punishing me for what I had done. But I went back to a church that I had been to 20 years before, and a men's group prayed for me. And I went on into that surgery, and it was successful. I'm here walking again today. They didn't think I was going to walk. And through that surgery, I met my wife. And that changed my life completely. We got married 31 years ago, and lo and behold, she was adopted. So here, a marriage was formed between someone who participated in two abortions and lost two children to my unwillingness to stand up for those mothers with a woman who mother stood up for life, and she is here today as my wife. Amen. With her help, thank you. Amen. With her help in leading the way forward, she started the Anglicans for Life program at our church, and together we are out trying to help those that are grieving. And it's all about forgiveness. It's not condemnation, it's about forgiveness. Uh, God had a plan for us. As contributors of two abortions, it was a wonderful event that we came together. So today, with my wife's leadership as the founder of that Angleton's Life Group, I go forward as a, in commitment to bring other men forward, to let them help talk about this, because we are part of that equation. And it's important, because we can leave this at the foot of the cross that pain from the past because of the healing nature of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is all about forgiveness and healing. God forgives us, he loves us, but he does not want, he does want us to be bold and silent no more. Thank you. Josefina Mata y vengo de Phoenix, Arizona. Hoy es un día especial para mí y mi hijo. Hoy vengo a decir que, que yo soy no más silencio. Hace 18 años, en septiembre de 1995, fui a hacerme una prueba de embarazo a los centros de Plain Parenthood. Cuando ellos me dijeron que la prueba era positiva, fue una gran sorpresa para mí y me sentí sin esperanza y con miedo, pues mi esposo no estaba conmigo. Lloré cuando me, dije, me dieron la noticia. Ellos al ver mi reacción me ofrecieron ayuda. Me fui y al no encontrar alternativas, según yo, regresé con los que supuestamente me ofrecían ayuda. No me di cuenta de la gravedad de mi acto hasta que el supuesto doctor terminó con la vida de mi hijo, con todo el consentimiento mío. Cuando terminó el procedimiento, ese día me quedé sin vida. Ese día sentí que mi alma se quedó en ese lugar. Cuando me llevaron a la sala de recuperación, me sentaron en una silla reclinable y me ofrecieron jugo y galletas. Yo observé que había más mujeres en la sala. Vi a todas las mujeres que, al igual que yo, se miraban muertas en vida. No tuve el valor de quedarme a recuperarme, pues sentía que el jugo y las galletas que me daban era un premio de consolación. Me sentí mareada, pero el dolor del alma era mucho peor. Esta decisión nos afectó a todos como familia. Hay un miembro de la familia que no está. Un hijo, un hermano, un tío, un novio, un esposo. 
No terminé con la vida de mi hijo, terminé con una generación entera. Les pido a mis hijas, ella es una, y me, a mi esposo que me perdonen por haberlos privado de haber tenido un hermano y a mi esposo un hijo más. Gracias a Dios encontré el viñedo de Raquel. Ahí encontré la reconciliación con mi hijo, con Dios y conmigo misma. Gracias a eso hoy puedo venir a decir que el abor aborto duele hasta el alma. Que no lo hagan, que esta decisión nos marca para toda la vida. Hoy sé que si hubiese tenido a Ángel Daniel, yo sería la madre más orgullosa del mundo. Que so hoy que soy no más silencio, yo quiero que mi hijo sea el bebé en el cielo más orgulloso de su mamá. Gracias. My name is April and I am from Phoenix, Arizona. brother. Ever since I was younger, I imagined my life with an older brother. Years ago, I found out I had one. But my mother ended his life in an abortion. <laughs> my parents went to a retreat called Rachel's Vineyard, and I thought it was just like any other retreat would go. The Sunday they came back, I cried and cried, and my parents kept asking what was wrong. But I didn't know. I just felt so emotional. A few years after, I remember we were picking up my older sister from a high school football game. And while we waited for her in the car, my mom then told me, my mom then told me about her abortion. It hurt me so much when she told me. <coughs> It all made sense. It made sense why I was crying the day she came back from that retreat. <clears throat> and why I've always wished for an older brother. It was all because I always had one. That desperate feeling, a need for an older brother was always because I actually had one. But he was not with us. <laughs> it hurt so much knowing it. For us siblings, it hurts too. An abortion will affect everybody around you. After all, I do forgive my parents for taking... I do forgive my parents. I love them so much, although they made that choice. I love my brother, although I don't personally know him. Good morning, my name is Frances and I'm from Seattle. I'd like to thank priests and Anglicans for life for allowing me to share my story with you today. I share it in the hopes that young men and women will understand that there is a dark reality to abortion that our secular media so vehemently denies. Like many youth from the 70s and 80s, I became involved in a lifestyle of drinking and drug use upon entering college. In the spring of my freshman year, I became pregnant. I was ashamed to tell my parents, and I feared that the father of my baby would leave if he learned of our child. I convinced myself that I had no other choice but to end my pregnancy. Planned Parenthood assured me that a first trimester abortion was a very safe procedure and was the best decision for my future. <clears throat> On the day of my abortion, I walked alone to the hospital. As the abortion was completed and the child inside me died, I felt an incredible sense of emptiness and guilt. I walked home alone, a spiritually dead young woman. 
I attempted to continue my life as it had been before my abortion, but I struggled with an increasing sense of despair. In addition to drug and alcohol use, I battled bulimia on an almost daily basis. Through these addictions, I sought temporary relief from the overwhelming guilt at having taken the life of my own child. By my junior year, I felt drawn back to my faith in the hopes that I might rebuild my shattered life. Through counseling, I conquered my chemical addictions, but my battle with bulimia would continue for many years. I accepted Christ's healing and allowed my forgiveness and accepted forgiveness for my actions, but it would be many more years before I was able to forgive myself. When I met my husband of 27 years ago, I brought that secret of my abortion into our marriage. When I finally told him about my abortion, he accepted me with love and compassion, but he recognized that the guilt that I still carried was harming our marriage. <coughs> I returned to counseling and was finally able to forgive myself for taking the life of my own child. I believe that I would never again speak of that terrible chapter in my life, but God oftentimes has different plans for us. Four years ago, I attended a Rachel's Vineyard retreat. The pain that was brought forth with each story of lost children was heart-wrenching. But through this powerful ministry, I found a safe place with others who suffered from abortion to grieve the life of my lost child, to heal the wounds that I did not recognize that I still carried, and to connect to my child in a profound way. This decision to end the life of my child is one that I will regret for the rest of my life. It is a choice I cannot change, but I am thankful to God that he has allowed me to heal through his grace and forgiveness, and that he now has allowed me to share my story without fear and to be silent no more. Thank you. We had a unique opportunity yesterday um, as we were talking about healing the shock waves and how it affects everybody. It also affects the people who work in the clinics. And so we've got a dear young woman, Patricia, who has worked in a clinic and she's going to share her story. Patricia. God bless everybody. My name is Patricia Sandoval. I'm from the Bay Area. But the Lord has had so much mercy on my soul because I did a lot of damage in the society. Not only did I hurt other women and men, but I hurt myself. So I'm gonna share my story briefly. Um, I grew up Catholic, traditional Catholic, went to mass once a year, and I had no idea what chastity was. My parents <laughs> never gave me that chastity talk, and in school I learned that the only thing I had to do to not get pregnant and to not get an STD was to wear a condom. So I had, my sexual education came from the world. When I was 19 years old, I was pregnant, and I was told it was not a baby, that it was a sack of tissue. And I remember when I uh, had my ultrasound, uh, I, I was two months pregnant, I actually saw the head and the arms of my child, but it wasn't formed, it wasn't a baby yet. When I was four months pregnant, my best friends came and said, Patricia, you're committing the worst mistake of your life. You're not ready to be a mom. It's not a baby yet. You need an abortion, you're four months, and it's gonna be too late. So I remember I went into the clinic and the doctor told me, you know, Patricia, don't worry. I've had an abortion myself and I performed two abortions on my daughter. My daughter's fine, I'm okay. This takes five minutes and you're gonna be okay. And I remember she said, you're not doing anything wrong. It's just a sack of tissue. And I decided to believe that in my heart. After that abortion, I had two more abortions, a total of three abortions. And I suffered from, um, syndrome, post-traumatic, uh, what is it, uh, po post-abortion syndrome. I got into a deep depression. I got into anorexia. I wanted to commit suicide. I had psychotic thoughts, mental disorders, and I didn't understand what these emo why I was feeling these emotions because I didn't do anything wrong. So after that, uh, since I worked in the medical field for so many years, I wanted to help women. I wanted to help women and I thought that, you know, it's your body and you could do whatever you want with your body. And I started to work for Planned Parenthood. So I went into Planned Parenthood thinking in Sacramento that I was gonna help women. And it's better to abort than to bring a suffering child in this world. And when I started working at Planned Parenthood, they trained me how to deceive women and men. 
They told me never to show an ultrasound. They, that screen always needs to face the nurse, that the patient could never, ever see that ultrasound. It was prohibited to use a word baby, he, she, mother, or father. I had to call it an it. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, don't move around. But anyhow, so my vocabulary, I had to change my vocabulary. And they told me to tell them that I had had three abortions. Tell the girls that you've had three abortions and they're gonna be okay. And if you see that a young girl is terrified and she's scared and she doesn't wanna come to her appointment to have an abortion, you need to do everything in your will so they will not, you know, back out, that they will make it to their appointment. So on Mondays at Planned Parenthood, in Spanish and in English, I'm, my, I'm Hispanic, I counseled and prepared women for their abortions, not knowing that I was actually selling murders. I didn't know what I was doing. So the day of the abortions came, the first time I assisted an abortion, I had to assist the doctor and I had to assist the young girl having the abortion. And I remember the first time that I took the bag that was connected to that machine and I went into a room, a little room that's hidden in, Black, in Planned Parenthood. And I remember that the nurse that was training me, she said, you will never tell a soul what you see behind these doors. You will not tell a mother or a father that after the abortion, we throw their babies away in the garbage. And I remember they said, empty that bag out in, that, in this Petri dish. It was like this huge glass Petri dish. And I remember when I opened and I discarded everything in that bag, I saw body parts in there. I really thought in my head that I was looking for a sack of tissue. And I remember she took some tweezers out and she started picking up the arms, the legs, the head. And she puzzled the body back together and she said the abortion is successful and threw it away in the garbage. And the patient can leave the room now. And I remember at the end of that day, in that garbage, there was 20 to 25 pieces of babies just piled up in this biohazard garbage bag. And the nurse said, Patricia, since it's illegal just to throw blood away, biohazard comes in here monthly and they discard the bag for us. But meanwhile, we need to store these bags in that freezer. And I remember when I opened this huge freezer, the first thing I saw were transparent, they're clear bags with 25 body parts converted into ice of all the abortions that Planned Parenthood had that month. And it was horrific. And I remember when I worked there, I could just hear women screaming and crying. You hear, my baby, my baby. I remember wiping tears off their faces and some even fainted. And it was completely, it was a complete holocaust. And they're just complete hypocrites there. I mean, it was just, it was just amazing. So I was tormented in my soul. That's when I realized I killed my own children. I killed my own children. I had to face my sin. Now I'll never forget the last day I worked at Planned Parenthood, this young girl came in and the manager said, Patricia, you will assist this young girl during her abortion today after your lunch. And I remember when I looked at her stomach, her stomach was pretty big. And she said, she's six months pregnant and Ooh. she's pregnant with twins. And when she said twins, I just imagined me discarding that bag and seeing two siblings and pieces in that Petri dish and I thought, I can't do this. I can't do this. I will have a heart attack if I see this. And I walked out of Planned Parenthood and I never went back. But what happened after three abortions, it's hard, after three abortions and suffering from all these symptoms and then helping parents kill their children, lying to them and saying it's a sack of tissue and two days later throwing their babies away in the garbage. Can you imagine my soul and my heart so I got into some heavy, heavy drugs. I got into methamphetamine, and I was a homeless person for three years on the streets, completely cracked out of my mind. I lived with um, people that sold drugs. I was running from the cops. I was so thin, I had pulled all my hair out. There's a, a disease called trichotillomania, where it's a high level of anxiety where people find the comfort in pulling their hair. Well, I was a dead person alive. When you looked at my face and looked into my eyes, there was no life in me. I didn't recognize who I was. I was just this failure, this piece of trash on the street, addicted to drugs with no hope in my life. And one day I was sitting on a curb on the sidewalk and all my drug friends had left me. And at this point, I had no drugs. 
I had no family. My family was ashamed of me. I had no friends. I had no food. I had nothing. And I remember I was crying on the side of the sidewalk. And I, for the first time in my life, when I looked up at the sky and the clouds parted, for the first time in my life, I felt God the Father. And I know he was looking down at me. And I looked up at the sky and I was crying. And I said to the Lord, I don't know who you are, but I know you exist. I have no drugs, I have no family, I have no food, and I'm a complete failure. But I know that you gave me such a beautiful childhood and so many blessings in my life, and I destroyed everything. And I just want to ask for your mercy and your forgiveness. And at that moment, I curled up in a fetal position, and I was bawling and bawling, and I felt somebody hug me from behind. And when I looked to see who was hugging me, it was this young, beautiful woman with blue eyes. Her name was Bonnie, because she had a name tag. And she looked at me and she said, Jesus loves you. And I said, excuse me? <laughs> she said, Jesus loves you. I'm a waitress at that restaurant and I was taking an order and the Lord spoke to my heart. And he said, look out that window and tell that woman that's on the street and drugged out that I love her, even if her mother or her father shall forsake her, I will be with her until the end of the times and I will never abandon her. And she said, I don't know where you live, Patricia, but you're going home today. And that's where the Lord took me. He took me out of a cloud of misery, an abyss of hell. And that's how God is. God is so merciful. And I just wanna say one thing. It's, the Bible says, Jesus says, that my people perish because of lack of knowledge because I didn't know what chastity was. One sin, having sex out of marriage, have, having sex out of purity. Look at the disaster that happened in my life. And I just wanna say one thing. I've had the gift of traveling the Latin American countries. I've spoke to 46,000 youth this year in Colombia and in Mexico. I go into the schools where Jesus isn't there. And you know what's really horrifying for me? That out of the thousand youth, nobody knows what chastity is. That is a problem. Do you know that 86% of abortions in the U.S. are women that are not married? We need a fight for life, but we need a fight for chastity. Amen. Please, we need to talk about chastity and purity. It's a way of life, and we need to teach our youth how to live in purity. God bless everybody. Thank you. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Judith Villegas y vengo de Phoenix. Yo es, escuchaba rumores que el aborto no era bueno y en mi corazón lo sentía, sentía que era malo. De chica siempre quise ser obediente, pero no lo logré. Deseaba ser el orgullo de mis padres, pero les fallé. Creí, esta, creí estar en, enamorada a los 16 años y quedé embarazada a los 17. Muy emocionada, pero también con miedo. Llegaron pensamientos de aborto. Enfrenté ese miedo y nacieron unas cuatas hermosas que llegaron a ser la luz de mi familia. Amos inmaduro, inmaduros, el padre de ellas y yo, seguimos. Salí embarazada por segunda vez. En este momento, el pensamiento de aborto regresó. Estando en una relación inexperta con muchos problemas, ¿cómo iba yo a traer a un niño indefenso a esta vida? Pensaba. Pero no me ganó ese pensamiento de nuevo. Y nació un varoncito que necesitaba el cariño de su mami. Ignorando que me podría pasar de nuevo, a los seis meses de que nació mi niño, me entero que estoy embarazada por tercera vez. Este pensamiento llegó aún más grande, más fuerte a mi vida. Pero algo dentro de mí no lo dejó entrar. Tuve una hija maravillosa que a pesar de que no escucha muy bien, me ha enseñado mucho. Seguí pensando que era intocable, que no me iba a pasar de nuevo. 
la relación seguía mal, pero de nuevo salí embarazada dos veces más. Ya con cuatro hijos, ¿con qué cara iba a ir con mis padres? A punto de separarme y embarazada. Esto no era aceptado por mi familia. Llegaron dos embarazos más. Esta vez sí le abrí la puerta al aborto, pensando que era lo mejor. Mi primer aborto fue un niño y el segundo fueron una, unas cuatas. Desde ese primer aborto, sentí que salí de ese lugar sin alma. Llegaron momentos que ya no quería vivir, incluso pensamientos de suicidio, intentos de suicidio también. Hoy vivo con una llaga en mi corazón porque les quité a mis hijos la oportunidad de vivir, a mi familia la oportunidad de conocerlos y de amarlos, y al mundo toda una, una generación, tal vez un doctor, un abogado, un sacerdote. Buscaba apoyo y quería remediar mi dolor. Encontré el viñedo de Raquel, que fue especial, fue especialmente para mí. Ahí sentí el perdón de mis, de mis hijos y de Dios y encontré el, el perdón. Hoy trabajo para ayudarle a las personas que, como yo, tomaron una decisión que les marcó su vida. Deseo llevar ese mensaje que Dios me dejó a mí, que no importa qué haya hecho, Él me ama, que mis hijos me aman y mi meta es dar lo mejor de mí y llegar al cielo donde ellos me esperan. Y por eso y soy silencio nomás. Amén. California. My dad was a military brat. My mom was raised in foster care. They divorced when I was six. My dad was distant and I never felt his approval. I witnessed dysfunctional relationships and alcohol abuse. I was molested twice and exposed to pornography early on. All this left holes in my heart that I would seek to fill through others. It didn't take long to get the boys' attention. Before I knew it, I was 15 and pregnant. Paralyzed by shame, a future beyond this was unthinkable. If my mom knew, she'd keep me from my boyfriend. My entire universe had revolved around him. A clinic verified my pregnancy and the so-called counselor agreed. I only had one option. I believed the lies of the industry, that it was a painless procedure and just a clump of cells. <coughs> Counting backwards, the anesthesia took effect and I awoke in the worst pain of my life. No one in that place seemed to care. I was just a number. My body healed quickly, but I was undeniably changed that day. I alienated myself from friends under the controlling ways of my boyfriend. I went from academic excellence to failing classes. Feeling depressed, I fed my emotions, gaining 80 pounds that year. Life did go on. I had children, and I married that high school boyfriend. But the strain mounted, and drinking became my antidote for the unspeakable pain. Tired of cheap fixes, I decided to try church one day. I was skeptical. God was patient, drawing me back again and again. He showed me that he could provide everything I ever needed. Despite, or maybe because of my growth, my marriage ended. As God was rebuilding me, he showed me that the abortion had been holding me back. Contrary to the media's portrayal of this good choice for women, I began to see it wasn't. 
God first brought me Christy. With her help, I began to find healing from my abortion through a Bible study at the pregnancy center. Later, on a weekend retreat, God revealed that I had aborted twins. When I first acknowledged my babies in heaven, I named them Jasmine and Miranda, and I haven't forgotten them a day since. My living twins, two sets, look forward to meeting them one day. God even brought me a husband who isn't put off by my strength or faith, but encourages it. I'm blessed to work in the pro-life arena as the director of the Irma Network, and my job, my nine to five J-O-B, is to shine light on the dark truth of abortion and to reach out to the wounded. Second Chronicles 714 says that when my people called by my name will humble themselves, pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, he will hear from heaven, he will forgive our sin, he will heal, heal our land. Amen. He hears, he forgives, he heals, even from the shame and guilt of abortion, and that is why I am silent no more. California. My nightmare began the day I walked into that abortion clinic. I bought the lie that it was a quick fix. It's not a quick fix. Instead, it's a lifetime of consequences. I have suffered from depression, anxiety, eating disorders, just to name a few. I felt like there was a sign on my back with the number on it and a dollar sign on my face. I was 26 weeks pregnant. That was six months. I felt my daughter kick and punch me as the abortionist administered the medicine inside my stomach. I later found out she was being burned. I unsuccessfully tried to save my daughter by immediately going to a local hospital, the labor and delivery department. But they told me that the healthy heartbeat everyone heard over the baby monitor would soon deteriorate overnight. And it did. The next day, after seven hours of labor, I gave birth to a beautiful yet lifeless baby named Lenore. As I held her, I remember slowly touching each of her fingers and grabbing each of her toes. I was thinking, oh my God, what have I done? It was heart wrenching to see my six daughters weep when I told them that the same mother they knew who fed them, the same mother they knew who nurtured them, the same mother that was overprotective of them was the same mother that ended the life of their younger sister. The same mother that stopped them from ever bonding with her, dancing with her, having a sister chat with her. It was me. I remember telling my son, he's seven years old, and I told him a couple of months ago, that the reason we visit his sister at the cemetery is because of me. I've hurt so many people because of the decision I've made. This barbaric act is not liberating, it is not empowering, but it is absolutely humiliating. It left an imprint on my heart that will never go away. Good, loving, smart women are being deceived into thinking this is a quick fix, and it's not a quick fix. There is a high probability that many of you know somebody that has had an abortion. The facts alone depict a grim picture. The facts alone will tell you that over 55 million lives have been destroyed. Over 55 million women have felt the impact of abortion. Over 55 million families are now incomplete. And over 55 million generations have ever generations have been eliminated. Men, 
and I'm talking to each one of you, you need to step up and protect your girlfriends, your mothers, your sisters, your nieces. This is enough. Enough is enough, and that is why I am silent no more. que mi familia vivíamos en la oscuridad por muchos años después de ese día terrible. Tan doloroso fue que me sentía sucia, avergonzada. Pensaba que Dios nunca me iba a perdonar. Quise enterrarlo para nunca saber o confrontar el daño que nos había hecho. No me podía perdonar a mí misma porque mi corazón estaba roto y lleno de coraje y dolor. No podía vivir conmigo misma. Cuando peleaba con mi marido, yo le decía que éramos asesinos. Peleábamos mucho. Y cuando alguien hablaba de aborto, yo lloraba para nunca parar. Hasta que un día, Dios mandó a mi querida amiga y me enseñó que Diosito nos había perdonado. Pero yo necesitaba sanar para poder perdonarme a mí misma. Nos invitaron a Rachel's Vineyard y ahí nos encontramos con nuestro Padre Dios, su Madre de la Virgen María y el Espíritu Santo. Solo así es como pude aceptar la realidad que yo, al igual que a mi familia, sí podríamos tener paz en nuestras almas. Gracias. stories here today. Our testimonies can't stop here. Our testimonies need to go home with you. I know that we're in your hearts now. You've heard our stories. You've heard our testimonies. Now we need you to take them back to where you live and use them to influence your friends and neighbors to recognize the harm abortion does to the baby to the woman, to the man, to the family, to our society. We must end abortion. And it is through our testimonies that we will make it unthinkable. SilentNoMore.com. It has healing resources. It has testimonies. It has articles and research, but it's useless if you don't go to it. So please use the resources that are online and let us all work together to be silent no more. I'm going to ask Father Frank, is he here to close us? Oh, one more. We have one more testimony. Okay. Janet Morana and I got together in 2002 over dinner and talked about an idea that I had come up with when I held my first sign at the 2002 March for Life that said I regret choosing abortion. Janet and I became the co-founders of Silent No More Awareness Campaign. Now folks, this was not at all what we ever dreamed we could do. And what I want you to know is that when God puts something on your heart and tells you he wants you to do it, do it. Even when you don't think you can, because you can't. We can't. But he does it through us. But he needs all of us to do that. So step out in faith and do what he tells you to do. And today, Janet is going to do something that is very difficult. 
and she shared in Washington, and she's sharing here today. Thank you, Janet. Well, a lot of you know me from being on EWTN, of course, with the Defending Life and Catholic View for Women, as Georgia said, uh, co-founding this campaign with her. But actually, I've been marching for life. Uh, tw this is my 26th year of coming to Washington, D.C. and marching for life. I have three daughters. Uh, they're all married. Uh, they're a blessing to me. And they were raised in a very pro-life family, Catholic family. I always told them how bad abortion was once I became active. I took them to Washington when they were little on bus trips. And so I thought I had given them all the tools they needed, you know, as they were into teenagers and young adults in their early 20s. I also have, I have an older daughter, Jennifer, and then I have twins, all right? And it was one of my twins uh, I have two twins, Tara and Kelly, but it was Kelly, my daughter Kelly, who, unbeknownst to me, when she was in school in Michigan, had an abortion. She hid it from me, she didn't tell me, but after she was in school for about seven months, she told me she wasn't feeling good, she was homesick. You see, she has a lot of medical issues. She's a type one brittle diabetic, insulin resistant, she has other gastro issues, so she's always been uh, a little fragile health-wise. So I didn't suspect a problem. You know, I was disappointed she was leaving college at that point, but I said, it's okay, you come home, you know, take some time off, maybe you'll go back to school in the fall. So we just addressed her diabetes and her gastro issues when she came home. But actually, it was the abortion that I didn't know about. So she got back in school that fall in a local school where we live in New York, and everything seemed to be going along okay. You know, we were getting her health issues in line. The following, about a year and a half later, I was off in California speaking for Priest for Life at an event. And I got a phone call from my daughter that she's in Dallas, Texas. I had no idea she was going to Dallas. And what she did was she went for another abortion. She actually walked into the Fairmont Abortion Clinic that I had been to numerous times with my pro-life activities with Father Pavone and Priest for Life, and I knew the very sidewalk counselors that were there that day when Kelly walked past them. Of course, they didn't know Kelly, but they were trying to intervene. Unfortunately, there was a complication there, not that the clinic even cared about, and she later went back to her hotel room and called me hysterical. Now I'm all the way in California and she's now telling me she, she had an abortion and she's violently ill. And so what did I do? I reached out to my pro-life friends in Dallas and a dear friend of mine, John Everett, who ran the White Rose Pregnancy Center said, don't worry, I'll get Kelly. He talk, took her to the emergency room, they did an ultrasound and she was still pregnant. Unfortunately, she lost the baby two months later. She had a miscarriage. And so we began to, her and I, to talk about it and put our, the pieces back together again. Like, how did this happen? And I was feeling very guilty because here I am out speaking publicly about the damage abortion is doing to women and how, you know, damaging it is. And my daughter always knew. I told my daughters, you can always come to mom. You know, if you become pregnant, no, I'm going to stand with you. We'll have that baby. I want to have grandchildren one day. So I started internally feeling very guilty. What did I do? What did I didn't do? And I'm sure I've, I've met other people throughout the pro-life movement who've had this same problem. The problem is, I think we feel a little shame to discuss it because we're supposed to be so right about this issue. We're supposed to have our act together. And how could a child of a pro-life parent go off and have an abortion? Well, I'm telling you, it happens. And I asked Kelly, why did this happen? And she said, Mom, I didn't want to disappoint you. So sometimes as much as we talk to our daughters, we have to, you have to keep it going and, pr and pray and pray and hope it doesn't happen because it can happen to even the best of us no matter what we do. And so I took Kelly, we went together to an abortion recovery program. We actually went all the way up to British Columbia, Canada to Dr. Philip Ney, the psychiatrist, and he has a program called Hope Alive and we did an intensive week together. And I can tell you it was life changing for both of us. I went on to go back to further training in the Hope Alive program and just this last year I passed my final exam. I'm now a Hope Alive counselor. 
but thank you. But the message here is you must speak with abortion, not in condemnation. And you have to assure your, your children that no matter what happens, you're there for them. I mean, I still go over in my mind, what could have I done to prevent Kelly from doing this? What could have I done? What could have I done? And I, I still don't have the answer. I guess one day the Lord will, will tell me that. But I'm going to now be silent no more. And Kelly wanted you to know that she did this when she was in her early 20s. After her healing, she went back in school. She actually went and got two master's degrees. And she's married to her husband now, wonderful husband, and they're looking forward, hopefully, to having children in the near future. So keep her in your prayers, because she's still a very sick girl with all those health issues. And I hope one day uh, that she will have a grandbaby. I also have, uh, you know, two grandchildren from my oldest daughter, Jennifer. So now I will be silent no more, because I have four grandchildren, two here on earth and two in heaven. Thank you. One of the girls traveled all the way from Ohio to share her story. Cindy? I went to Mass this morning. Okay, there you go. My name is Cindy. I'm from Ohio. When I was 14 years old in 1972, I had an abortion. It was illegal then in the state of Ohio, and we had to fly to New York City. Our, our family doctor encouraged this, encouraged my parents. They said I was too young to actually have a baby safely, and I don't think they knew any better. My boyfriend and I felt abortion was killing of a baby, but we felt pressured, especially at that age, to get an abortion. Prior to the procedure, the anesthesiologist said, if you like our business, come back. When I awoke, I felt immediate remorse and sadness and a grief that you can't, unimaginable. Um, there were many moaning and groaning in the, in the board because I wasn't alone in the room. There were several of us. I suffered from depression and I was hospitalized twice. I was, I used, I was married four times and I used alcohol and people and food to fill the void that couldn't be filled. My children saw my pain and said they had to grow up quickly, especially for the times that I was not functioning well. They tell me they mourned the loss of their older sibling as well as their mom. I found healing by the grace of God by attending a study for post-abortive women called Surrendering the Secret, and now I am silent no more. Thank you, Sarah. God bless you. It takes a lot of courage to stand up here and admit our mistakes. It's a vulnerability, and it's the grace of God, and we need you to take our stories forward, so please, Father Frank, please come and close us in prayer. Friends, we also have these cards. Some of you have received these cards or the smaller ones. This will help you to bring back to your own pro-life communities and churches the information about this Shockwaves initiative. We have Silent No More, but then the Shockwaves is showing the, the injury and the damage to the wider circle of victims, as you've heard here today. Grandparents, siblings, abortion providers themselves and less let me point out that we have a table down at the exhibit space the first booth right on this side you will see uh, priest for life silent no more and stand true which is our youth outreach well friends what a blessing this is to be able to have these testimonies as each group is expressing their repentance and healing, it helps the healing of all the others. So when a mom is expressing her repentance, the dad is helped. When a dad expresses his repentance, the mom's healing moves forward. And imagine how they both feel when an abortion provider expresses his or her repentance uh, and, uh, and everyone else as well. So all during this year, this project will educate, mobilize, 
and get the message out in churches, in the media, and we ask you to be part of it along with us. If you don't get one of these cards here today, just go to silentnomore.com and look at the Shockwaves logo, and you'll be able to work with us throughout the year, because here's what I hope will happen. Let me share this one thought, and then we'll, then we'll pray. As a woman goes through post-abortion healing, as many of you know from experience, one of the things that happens is that many of the problems that she's experiencing in her life, whether it's low self-esteem, relationship difficulties, substance abuse, or whatever else it might be, at a certain point she realizes that that problem was connected to her abortion. She may not have known that before, or the abortion made the problem worse. Once she knows that, it doesn't make the problem disappear overnight, but it gives her a stronger perspective and motive to deal with it. It gives her hope to know the connection. Well, as we heal the shockwaves of abortion, as we heal the whole family, as we heal the whole society and everyone admits how abortion has damaged them, then as a society we'll start to realize that so many of our societal problems are rooted in abortion. So many of our societal problems are made worse by abortion. We stand up and we say, oh, isn't it terrible if, if children kill children in our schools? Well, now we can stand up and say, children will not stop killing children until parents stop killing children. Right. We can look at our problems in society and we can say, oh, well, we have to stop violent crime. You're not going to stop violence from stranger to stranger if you can't stop violence from mother to, mother to child. We want to solve, solve the problems of poverty. Well, how are we going to feed the poor if we can't even feed our own flesh and blood? You won't do it. And then we say, well, we have to, to, to stop terrorism. And we have to build good international relations and peace between different countries. And I ask you today, how can we build peace between different countries if we can't have peace between a mother and her own child? And so what's needed here is an awareness, an awareness of how abortion has damaged everything it touches, how it has damaged our public system of government, how it's damaged the medical community, how it's damaged our young people, how it's damaged everything it touches. And yet, brothers and sisters, as we look at all this pain, and we've heard a lot of this pain right here today, we do not get discouraged. We look at this pain and we say, we know the one who has conquered it. Right. We know the one who can heal it. Right. We look at the devastation that death causes and we say, we know the one who is risen from the dead. Yes. Right. And that's why we don't scratch our heads wondering how are we going to overcome the abortion industry? How are we going to come up against Planned Parenthood with all its money and all its influence, all its political strength? How are we going to come up against all these anti-life forces that have so much control of the media? We don't sit back and wonder, oh, can we do it or will we do it? We look at that and we say to these enemies of life, you've already been conquered in Jesus Christ. We're not, we're not playing on an equal playing field. The playing field between good and evil is not equal. The playing field between life and death is not equal. We have the upper hand. Friends, that's how it is now, and that's how it'll always be. So as we go walking today, and then as we go back into our own communities, we bring that sense of confidence. That's what we need is confidence. It's not enough to educate people about the horror of abortion or to mobilize them. We gotta constantly feed their spirit with that faith, with that hope, with that confidence, and that's what we do through Priests for Life, helping the clergy, helping all of you individually, helping your groups. We're going to continue to do that. And so please connect with us, stay in touch with us during the course of the year. We will have victory marches before long. Victory marches. So with all this in mind, 
Let's now turn again to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we thank you today for the victory of life. We thank you that Jesus Christ took upon himself our human nature. The same humanity shared by rich and poor, by strong and weak, by born and unborn, we thank you that he has raised our humanity to the heights of heaven. And we thank you that he has given us the wisdom and the strength to defend life. Father, may we never be silent. May we never be passive. May we never let anyone make us feel that this is none of our business. And may we never let the words of the devil into our mind that we cannot reach our goal. We can and we will. We will reach the goal of protection for the unborn. We will reach the day when abortion is a sad memory of the past. And let today's walk inspire us to continue moving in that direction by your grace, O oh God, through the power of your word, through the power of healing the wounds and the shockwaves of abortion. As we heal, so we grow in strength as we heal so we become more powerful witnesses than ever before. So bless all those who will walk. Bless all those who will see us walk. Bless all those who will speak at this rally today and all those who will be reached via media. And Lord, even bless those who oppose us, those who will be against this walk today in the streets, who will yell at us, spit on us, ridicule us, and even try to stop us from walking. Lord God, they are not the enemy, they are captives to the enemy. And we ask you to set them free. Yes. Amen. Set them free that they may rise up out of error and falsehood. Set them free that instead of opposing us, they may walk with us. Yes, Lord. And forgive them, Lord, their sin of supporting the evil of abortion. Forgive us all for anything that we have failed to do. Forgive us all for any way that we have failed to reach out or rise up or speak up or act up or do whatever it is, Lord, that you call us to do. From this day forward, we will do it with even more faithfulness, with even more confidence, with even more trust, with even more peace and joy. Because Lord of life, you are the source of our peace and joy, a peace that no one can take away from us. And in that spirit, let us now pray together the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And may we sing together, brothers and sisters, may we sing together, He is Lord. He is Lord, He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. 